Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for attending. I've learned two very important things. One, never follow Nathan in your presentation because he takes all your points ahead of time. <laughs> second, yours when I made my <laughs> the, the second thing is evidently there are no atheists during takeoff landings and now when driving in automated cars. So I'm Andrew DeCease. Um, I'm the founder of a thing called Objectivity. We're a data analytics firm specifically in the mining industry. And um, I'm going to talk a little bit about this idea of moving from mining's dark age into an innovation and uh, renaissance. So we tend to think in our judo-Christian training European base that the Middle Ages was this uh, dark period where we lived in hovels for 25 years of our life, then we died and we had no good ideas. And when you look at all the press and you hear about all the amazing things that are being done in the mining industry, we have that same feeling that, wow, we're in a renaissance now and for the last 400 years, what have we done? So I'm going to take a first grim view of the mining industry. This is McKinsey, looked at uh, productivity and determined that Overall, we're losing 3.5% decline per year, 28% over a 10 year period. And that's not good. It's not good for the industry. And you can see there's a little bit of a blip in 2013, just as the industry tanked, right? Everyone realized that we were in trouble, and so we started focusing on productivity. And maybe the updated graph is slightly better. The other graph is um, from Minex Consulting. And Minex Consulting is a, a, a fellow named Richard Schoda. And he looks at uh, macro trends within the exploration industry. This is taken from the PDAC 2016. And what I'd like you to focus on is the Canadian numbers. So um, estimated exploration ex expenditure at $27 billion. Generated mineral resource estimated at $16 billion. So for every dollar you put into the ground exploring, you can expect to get a resource, reportable resource, of 0.62 cents. You haven't actually taken the mineral out of the ground and sold it. You just think you know it's there within some level of, of risk. What's really interesting is that for $27 billion invested that same year, we sold $24 billion of metals, non-metals, and coal in Canada. So we spend more than we produce and the spend that we produce doesn't regenerate the value that we're putting into the ground as an industry. And so this talk is going to be a little bit about why I think that happens. Now on the flip side of the coin, we have been doing amazing things. So we'll look at central operations centers. One of the big things that came out of the last mining boom is Rio Tinto with their Mines of the Future. Um, originally, this talk was given as a keynote to the Australian Center for Geotech, and they had just announced that day in uh, October that their two-year project started in 2012, has been completed, and they can take a train and they can drive it through the desert automatically. And I thought to myself, well, that's amazing, half a billion dollars to drive a train on a track where you don't need to steer it in a desert where there's very few things to hit. How difficult can that be? And then I noticed this slide. It had to do with software. And then it makes sense. As soon as you start any investment in software, you know you're going to be over budget, you're going to be late, and it's going to be difficult. And in the news today or this week, we hear about Phoenix. How difficult can it be to do payroll for civil servants in Canada? Um, the new price tag to fix Phoenix is estimated at $540 million. And the uh, footnote is that's OK because the Australians paid $1.2 billion to fix their payroll system. I don't know. It, it, is, it is a boggling number. And it's, it's, it's difficult to find out who the contractor was. So um, Rio Tinto, interesting parameter since 2008, talking about automated trucks. Again, the idea is to displace the worker so that a truck can work uh, more time. What's interesting is a 10% increase in utilized time. Complex, large company, large investment, changes to get 10% improvement in end of line production. So possibly tons, but for a time being increased time. But do you have to be large to make a significant change? So most people in the room know Rick Howes, know of Dundee, the work that they've done in opening the lid in the mine, taking commodity off the shelf Wi-Fi, putting it into a mine that arguably had their back against the wall, 
and then coming out and spinning out to both a technology company to sell the Wi-Fi system, now investment in mine RP. Um, original work was done with Dassault. Dassault, certainly an interesting company, company that understands engineering. They work with Airbus, they work with Boeing, Mercedes, um, integrating engineering systems. They purchased both Surpac and uh, Gemcom and came into the mining space. The hope was they would take that engineering knowledge and bring it into the mining space and you would start getting integrated design, much as we see when we fly in it or when, when an aircraft is designed. AI machine learning, I think a big shift happened in 2016. Um, Integra, or sorry, 2016, when Integra Challenge had SGS win and they used um, relatively simple machine learning to match what an explorationist would do to target within the Lamac property at Integra. So that's interesting because now we're saying we have highly trained, skilled individuals. And SGS demonstrated that they could use a relatively simple algorithm to come up with the same outcome. The big one is automation. If we can displace people, a lot of mines have automated LHDs. The idea is you're teleoperating at a distance. The person doesn't have to move to the face. The, uh, the LHD or the bogger in Australian can move to the draw point, and at the draw point, the individual takes over and basically controls the loading cycle. This is a 2014 video, Queen's University, oops, demonstrating their loading, their autonomous loading system. From an automation point of view, this is really interesting because the rock that's in front of the machine isn't modeled. The machine has no idea of what the rock is going to be like. In this case, it happens to be 50 centimeter or less than 50 centimeter, some type of relatively soft, low density rock. And you can see that the thing loads it. Queen's University um, has uh, licensed this to Atlas Copco, and I'm assuming it's available for sale. And soon you'll be able to have, if at least, not fully automated LHDs, at least LHDs that can help the operator muck on their own. So think of ABS braking, but for loading your bucket. So a little bit about me. Uh, as Nathan said, there's no bio. Why should I be giving this talk? I've spent 20 years in innovation and mining, and I'll, and I'll walk you through a reverse history of, of some of the work that I've done. And all of it has been pretty um, cutting edge. So it's actually trying to do things. Objectivity. Uh, data analytics, we do one thing really, really, really well, is we decrease your overall drilling cost for resource conversion, and um, we can decrease that cost by about 20%, which is equivalent to a 25% improvement in efficiency. So if you have to make a number of meter cubes reportable, or a number of tons reportable, we can help you do that at a 20% at a reduction to what you're drilling today. Started off we, uh, with Morocco, which was an R&D group, we looked at um, 3D visualization, large-scale visualization. You may have seen some of the work that was done at the PDA to help people promote the properties. Um, the original Gold Corp under Robin McEwen was one of the companies that used it, Placer Dome. In fact, um, the Red Lake Mine had a 3D facility. And what was misunderstood, I think, was the original VR was not a bunch of people staring at virtual or augmented worlds, not working together or, or basically replacing location with VR. It was the idea of getting better than 3D data projected into a room so experts could work with that data and learn from that data. So companies like Cadelco, Rio Tinto installed um, facilities and, and had their people start doing, I think, more valuable mine design. Prior to that, Leaky Feeder, prior to that, tried to get out of the mining industry, and my career began at the Naranda Technology Center. And the Naranda Technology Center was really an amazing place. It was the heyday of mining research in Canada, I would argue. Um, their, Naranda was a prime resource company. Their investment in mining research was equivalent to what they were spending on exploration, roughly 25 to $30 million, and those are uh, 1990 dollars. And I'd like to show you two projects that were developed um, 
at NTC. So the first one is plasma blasting, the idea of breaking rock using electricity. At the time, we had Reagan. Reagan was producing capacitors to send into space so that he could blow out satellites. We use those capacitors to create a charge that is discharged into a probe, which is drilled into the rock, as you saw. And that creates a plasma. Plasma generates a shock wave, goes out, it breaks the rock. PBT had some problems. Very large amount of energy, very small amount of time. Components would tend to fail relatively rapidly. Rock had to be unconstrained. You had to have an open face to be able to break it. Second project I'd like you to look at is um, HDRK. HDRK was Falcon Bridge, Inco, Noranda, and Kid Creek Mining coming together to fund pre-competitive research. Part of that pre-competitive research was road headers. Um, so the idea of getting over the fact that in mining rock is very, very hard and civil road headers actually couldn't work because of the, the rock hardness. Another one of the projects was automated loading. So this is 1995, we're at Metogamy. This is a uh, LHD that uh, was basically forgotten on a level and so they gave it to us researchers. What you see is the individual is going to come off, he's going to select a mucking pattern, low, medium and high and you'll see the LHD go in and uh, come back with a bucket. So he selects the cycle. Wait till you see the advanced 1994 visual graphics that we're going to put up in a second. Wait for it. Look at that, 16,815 pounds. More importantly, realize that the size of that rock is larger than the bucket and the vehicle could pick it up automatically. There was no human interaction. The algorithm that we used came out of MIT. At the time, Naranda was funding a program with MIT. We had access to, in this case, a fellow named Rodney Brooks. You may know Rodney Brooks as uh, the guy behind iRobot, and iRobot are, is the company that produced the Roombas. We used that algorithm to produce this. Overall, uh, when we started off, the operator said, I don't want to work with these researchers. After a couple of weeks, he says, I'd like my bonus to be based on whatever this machine mucks, because the machine was mucking 9% more than he ever could. So, 1995. You saw what the mucking looks like in 2014. What happened for 23 years? Where did the technology go? How did we as an industry walk away from 9%, which is equivalent to the 10% that Rio Tinto had with the automated trucks? What possibly could happen? And so we know that as researchers, we did not communicate the value well to operators. We came in with eight sensors and one CPU that had to be mounted on the vehicle, on vehicles where there were no sensors, there were no, certainly, CPUs. Today, you buy an LHD, you get 50 to 70 sensors, maybe six to eight CPUs, the same as you would have in the car. And that was one of the big changes, right? It was this barrier of complexity that we could not get over to be able to implement the 9% improvement in bottom line. And you think about what that 9% would mean to every mining company in Canada had it gone through. But there's a bigger problem. And we look back, because this is complicated. There's sensors, there's equipment. But think about the Gold Corp challenge. So Rob McEwen went at Gold Corp, takes his database of information, puts it out on the web, gets a whole bunch of people to submit where they think they should be drilling, gives out, I think it was half a million dollars. And the industry watched. And then nobody repeated that for 15 years until Integra did in 2016. How can that happen? And so that's what I'd like to explore in the rest of the talk. How can that happen? But I'd like to run a small simulation with you. So let's play a game. So you're, we were all asked to bring $10 bills, did you? Yeah, everybody have a $10 bill? So Nathan's going to help me. Nathan, Nathan is a currency expert today. He went out and he got... 
is that take one? 13. I got 150 pesos. <laughs> okay, here's the value proposition. I have this piece of polymer, it's a $20 Canadian bill, there's no tricks to it, no magic. I'd like to sell this to somebody for $10. Who's the first bidder? Me. Where? Thank you very much. Okay, so that's relatively simple. It's 100% return, instantaneous, right? Only because Justin could say, me. And you had your hand up, but he's closer and it's easier to get to you. Actually, I'll put that in here. This is a check. It's an objectivity check. It's off our original account. It's worth $20. It's made out to cash. Hold on. <laughs> now, I have to tell you, I have to tell you, if this thing bounces, it'll probably cost you $40 to $60 because your bank's certainly not going to take the loss, and I won't be able to pay it because there's $20. But I can assure you probably, probably, that the $20 is good. Right. So, who? I'll take it. Now. I don't, I don't know what to do with you because I don't see your money. Uh, and I'm closer. Thank you very much. Cash is key. Okay. Last, uh, third one. Third one. We could play a fourth one. The fourth one's an NBA game, which is really fun. Third one. Envelope with a certain amount of money in it. And we're going to mimic expiration. We need an expert, please. So. Mining industry, you have some resource in the ground, you have to estimate it. Nathan's going to estimate it for us. So it's a two-step process. You need to pay Nathan $10 to hire him as an expert. Is there somebody here who's going to hire Nathan? There we go. Second step, Nathan, Nathan is going to be allowed to look in the envelope and he's going to be able to tell you yes or no whether it's a good bet, right? Okay. <laughs> but it's the mining industry, so we're just not going to let Nathan look into it. It's a highly folded deposit. And Nathan works for a, a junior, so there really wasn't a lot of exploration done on the property. So yes or no? Yes or no? No. Okay, no. Okay, does anybody want to bid on it anyway? No. Oh, wait a minute. I forgot to tell you. The client wants you to put on rose-colored glasses during the evaluation. So do the best you can. Oh, actually, it feels like a gold bar. Yeah. It's objectivity. There ain't no gold bar in there. <laughs> okay, I changed. I think it could be worth it. Okay, so who, who, who thinks it's worth it? Who's going to put in the extra 10? You need, you need a JV, basically, or you need another 10. Do you have another 10? Where's the 10? <laughs> what, you think this is faith? Okay, the envelope is yours. 50, 50. Okay, 2020. Who thought? What's the angle? Anyone think that? Why would why would he give out a twenty dollar bill for ten? Nobody thought that, but nobody but you. Okay, good, good. So let's um, let's look at the three cases. The twenty dollars is a no brainer. Right? It's real currency. How can you go wrong? The second one is mitigated investment, mitigated risk. I gave you a fair warning that that check could bounce. You may want to hang on to that check in case I become either famous or infamous. The signature may be worth more than the $20. <laughs> the third one is today's investment environment in mining. There is some level of value that you're hoping is probably good. Keep in mind, I told you at the very, very beginning, every dollar invested gives you a return of 62 cents. You hired a professional to go out and do an assessment for you with limited information, and then you made a buying decision to buy an envelope that you don't know the value of for $10 with an additional $10 investment to Nathan. There's a third experiment that happened here, and that's the innovator. The innovator goes off, takes a hypothesis, invests money, tries something, learns something from it, and moves on. Hypothesis could be correct. Hypothesis could be wrong. Hypothesis is wrong. Other than the learning, you lose the money. So I've invested the money that I've put in there with the good expectation that Tim's not going to cash the check because he believes that there's a high risk and that the envelope doesn't actually contain anything more than a couple of uh, coins. And so I walk away with some value of money. There's also 
other value. For those of you who do things with Facebook and Google, the value is not necessarily in the information that you provide, but rather in the information that you get. Had I picked up a business card from each one of you, that could have been valuable for me. So if you had said 10 years ago, I am going to produce a map of the world and I will show you pictures of every street and I will give you every direction from any location to any direction or any other location using bus, bike, walk, car, and I'll do it for free, you'd go, you're crazy, you can't do that. Particularly if you were a Garmin and you were selling world maps at the time for $250 per region. But that's exactly what Google did. Why? Because you're willing to sign off on information, let them track where you're going in exchange for that information. Many of us work two hours a day from Facebook for free. So what are our challenges? How, how does this translate into the real world? Well, it's difficult for us to move forward. $10 is not significant to most of the people in the room, nor is the $20 that we invested in the experiment for illustrative purposes. But we do have challenges in the mining industry. And so we, we, um, we're a commodity product. Nobody lines up when Cadelco brings in the first train load of copper for the year. And certainly, grade uncertainty is an issue. We never really know what's in the envelope. In fact, I don't know what's in the envelope because I just tossed in some loose change. The other thing is risk capital. By the time we've covered discovery risk, estimation risk, design risk, permitting risk, and license to operate, there's nothing left to go and experiment with things that are going to mess up a time-proven process of getting rock out of the ground. The other thing is, when you listen to the IR people, this is what they're selling you. And by the time that first piece of ore comes up from the ground, that's what your project looks like. And if you listen to McKinsey, four out of five mining projects are over budget by 43%. That's our reality today. When we go in, we tell our shareholders that we're going to build something. The expectation is that you'll not get in on budget. And how is that acceptable? And part of that is because we don't change our business models. So we're also, Another challenge is the cyclical nature of our industry. And as you start doing any type of technology development, if you hit a trough, you have to stop and you lose that intellectual property. The Naranda Technology Center is replaced with a bunch of condos. All of the information from 200 researchers basically got absorbed somewhere and vanished. But the cycle is a bit more perverse because when you're low, well, I've got no money to do innovation. When you're high, I certainly don't have time because I've got to get tons out. And when you're really, really low, don't even call me because I'm certainly not going to rock the boat because I'm one of the last survivors from everybody else in the department. And so how do we bridge that gap? And it's a difficult gap to bridge. The other thing is when you look at the general population, you have innovators, you have laggards, you have a whole distribution. And so if you're developing a piece of software for Android with a billion users, you're going to get that whole cross section. Now, we were just having a talk with Nathan at the beginning that even with diversity, we still hire the same type of person, right? The square peg in the square hole, because that's what we've always done. And um, on LinkedIn, I, I read an article where the fellow was talking about um, how innovators have to exist in an environment where the thing that you are compensated for <coughs> is decreasing variance. Innovators do not decrease variance. Innovators go out and say, I didn't know there was a box I had to work in. What's the box? And so in any industry, any application, you have those who know, the people who've been there for 30 years, they've tried it, they know why it's not gonna work. And then you have the innovators that come in with this machine learning stuff and all kinds of other things. And most of their time, at least according to the guy on LinkedIn, 90% of the time is trying to convince those who know that their idea is good and valuable. Those who know this check is worth the $20 that's written on here. Yeah, there may be some risk, but it's probably $20. The other thing is we're a relatively small market from a technology point of view. So the size of the circle represents market cap. Market cap is an indication of how the market perceives your future value. BHP is about one eighth of Apple. 
Rio is about one eighth of alphabet. I think Rio and, and BHP just flipped yesterday. Um, one of them went down, the other one went up. So I think the largest market cap mining company today is Rio Tinto. Hmm? Yes, that's a good sign. The bigger problem. Oh, by the way, for those who've noticed that Pfizer is in blue for the male blue pill of uh, late stage happiness, yeah? Lots of money. If you take those nine companies and you want to match the market cap for Apple, you have to find another 30 mining companies. And I'd argue it's pretty difficult for any of us to name 39 mining companies in the world. So how do we attract people into a very limited market, to a cyclical market, and where most engineering is done by rule of thumb, by those who know and say, well, I can't necessarily trust your math because you don't know. And I certainly can't trust, or it's difficult for me to trust a black box AI. And we see that with our drill hole programs. We can go out and produce KPIs and show that every KPI is better, and the geologist can still look and say, no, it's not as good as my program, but can't explain why. So is that fuzzy feeling real? Now, for those of you, most of you drove here, right? There's a lot of innovation in cars. Oh, a slight parenthesis. I, I went looking for innovation in cars because I'm told the Canadian economy relies a lot on innovation in the automobile industry. And GM has just come up with hotspots. Your car can be a hotspot. And I thought to myself, you know, as a teenager, my car was a hotspot quite often. So there's nothing really new there, which puts me in the league of the old people who think they know. We are lucky, I think, that aircraft are not designed based on feel. The aircraft are designed on engineering principles. And I think it is one of the challenges for our mining schools, for our geologists, to start moving away from empirical systems to quantified engineering principles, given the level of uncertainty that we have in our industry. Because when we produce a resource, that resource is only an estimate. But we're making progress. So um, Nathan mentioned unearthed. I'm going to mention two other initiatives. The internet was built on standards. Companies that tried to come in with their own standards were basically pushed out. It's one of the reasons why we have the level of innovation that we have today. Mining industry has two standard groups, IREDES for machines, and uh, more recently, GMSG. If you have two takeaways from this presentation, the second one should be, please support the open mining format in any of your RFPs or request to your vendors. It is a GMSG um, format that allows open interchange between the major mining GMPs. So any company that has to deal with mining data has to deal with some type of data translation. There's always data loss. There's always some type of misrepresentation. And the OMF is trying to solve that. Right. So the other thing that's interesting in the mining industry is we're starting to have competitions a little bit like Kaggle, um, Disrupt Mining. We got to be a semi-finalist uh, last year for, for the drill hole thing. Uh, being a semi-finalist in Disrupt Mining is, is really like being a uh, usher or a bridesmaid. It's not at all like being part of the main event. You certainly do get recognition for the work that you've done. Um, we got a couple of free beers and some pictures, and as a mining engineer, I thought that was pretty good, you know? Uh, Disrupt Mining was a call for ideas, and the latest one just came out, I think, two days ago for 2018. Again, Gold Corp is the main sponsor. What's interesting was that most of the people in 2017 were mining type people. Mining type people provided ideas for mining solutions. Very few outside of mining, which isn't the case with Unearthed. Unearthed is another organization out of um, Australia, and they uh, get companies to sponsor the same type of thing as Kaggle is doing, but live events, 54 hours, produce an application. Uh, it was really interesting to see that 70% of the participants are not mining people. 
So we have a blueprint to move forward. We've proven it with health and safety over 20 years. The culture of mining health and safety has completely changed. And that includes um, you know, support from the CEO level, systems that are in place, evaluation criteria. And my argument is we have to do the same thing for innovation. We are going to get a wave of innovation coming into mining and we neither have the pull nor much of the experience, as we've seen in the last slides, to deal with that innovation. And so one possible change is to follow what we've done in health and safety. And if you've visited a modern mine, you know that safety is fundamentally different than it was 15, 20 years ago. And safety can stop production, as it should. So I'll put up a quote from AWS. AWS is uh, Amazon Web Services. The keywords you want to read are, so this is uh, a, a gentleman who works. He's not senior management. The point, I've rarely seen so much appetite for change at such a high pace. And culture eats strategy for breakfast. And so we can create as much strategy we, as we want if the culture is not in place to innovate. It will be basically repeating what we've already done. Current state. It's the envelope, folded, limited information. <coughs> but I believe we can take a step through better modeling, better information exchange, collaboration, to move at least towards a mitigated investment where there's some quantifiable basis for assessing your investment and innovation, and hopefully to move to a no-brainer where the value is so high that you need to implement that innovation. Interestingly, uh, the World Economic Forum says there's something like $390 billion of pent-up opportunity if we could only innovate in the mining industry. 70 or $88 billion of that would be coming from connected workers. I think the much higher value is in the agility, the capability of being able to react to the uncertainty that we have in the mining industry. And to finish off, I thought I'd show you what happened with plasma blasting. So the technology was costing uh, Naranda a couple million dollars a year, and one day we're walking in the CIM and we see this. To reduce the largest of rocks to manageable sizes, there is a tool that is safe, convenient, cost-effective, and fast. The Boulder Buster Mark II, the Boulder Buster equipment, is easily manageable I guess it portable. only has an impulse barrel. It consists of the impulse barrel impulse takes a shotgun barrel. shell. You then take a trigger, you pull a rope 20 feet back, you pull the rope, the rope triggers the shotgun shell, the shotgun shell creates a shock wave and breaks open the boulder. That was the shot that killed PBT at Naranda. The vice president, the senior vice president at the time who made the decision, saved Naranda a number of millions of dollars of research but I think what we lost was the capability of driving drifts automatically with no explosives. And that would have been far more valuable than any money that Naranda could have saved in, in the 20 years of development of a blastless drifting system for hard rock. I thought I'd, 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 I'd tried to come up with something really, really smart about innovation and I failed. You can read these, but I think, I think the key is the culture of try it, learn from it, and move forward. But there is one thing, and that's this graph. And if you look for the first 30 years of existence, 2D had dominance, 3D came in, and then all of a sudden technology started moving much quicker. SGS with machine learning, variable geology, which got bought out by uh, the LeapFrog guys for Web 3D, LeapFrog with implicit modeling, GoCAD with some of the work that they were doing. And I think as professionals, we no longer have time to adapt. We have to get in front of the curve. We have to innovate. Thank you very much.